Well, good. Hello, my name is Alexandra Asali, and I think war took me to attempt to understand why we do what we do in wars. Why do, why do we kill each other? Why do we do such dreadful things as human beings? And having lived through many awful things in both in my youth and my, my parents' youth, have they all lived through wars. And then I land myself by marrying a Lebanese into the Middle East. And I lived through the civil war in Lebanon between 75 and 90. And I start reflecting about war and about my participation and what's my responsibility for, as a human being, for war. So that took me on a long, long journey and I became a psychotherapist. I did, I've been thinking and thinking and thinking and I was led by many miraculous, wonderful happenings to look at the ancestral patterns, the past, the historical roots of nearly every single grievance, both in families, in tribes, nations, and the world. So are divisions in the world. And there's hardly a country that doesn't have these divisions. In fact, I was at the Parliament of World Religions uh, recently, and there was a Aborigine leaders giving a talk and they had a huge map of Australia and they had red dots, red patches all round Australia and they said these red patches are where the massacre of innocence happened and these, this is the cause of all the troubles in Australia, the fires, the winds, the drought, everything that's happening is because of the unquiet dead. And I asked this, these leaders, I said, well, you must have the capacity to release your dead in your tradition. And I think they do have that capacity, but they said they didn't know all the places or, or they didn't have access. But their anger was still very present and their distress. So for me, that, that is a clue that forgiveness hasn't happened and that the souls of the dead have not been released if you believe in that kind of thing. And if you don't believe in that kind of thing, um, you can just look at some of the medical records on forgiveness and it's all there in the blood pressures and the hemoglobins or whatever it happens to be. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I'm, I see the results. And I was led through a personal experience, as I suppose I could call it a spiritual experience, um, to think about the contract between the living and the dead. So talking about this experience with the Aborigine leaders is exactly spot on. But in 1997, I had an experience and I asked a question to the to God, because I chat to him from time to time, and I said, am I on the right track? Is there a contract between the living and the dead? Is, do the dead hold the living and do the living hold the dead? And I knew what I was talking about, and the response was absolutely overwhelming, and totally overwhelming, and every vibe, every cell in my body seemed to sort of come alive and transform, and I mean, it was just, totally amazing and as a result of that experience I knew I had to do something I knew it had to be in Beirut I knew it had to be something to do with war and the only thing that I knew could release the living from the dead and the dead from the living was forgiveness and compassion so that's where I started and it wasn't easy I didn't come up with the garden straight away I came I, I had this sort of burning understanding, but not not really knew what to do with this energy. And then bit by bit, to symbolize this experience, um, and chatting with a colleague of mine who was a kind of mystic, 
I came through with the idea of doing a garden of forgiveness in the center of Beirut. And then the, the rest of the story is just magic. I mean, who, you know, it was just so magical. My husband took a bit of paper with my dream on it, my vision on it, to the head of the company rebuilding the city. And they said, oh yeah, why not have a garden? We'll have a garden. We have lots of gardens planned. And they gave me a map of the city with the patches. Now the city at that time in 1998 was rubble, complete, almost entire women I mean, flattened. And I walked around the city over the rubble with my map of these places and I asked for a sign. Okay, where am I going to, where's the garden going to be? Where's the sign? What's the sign? And I walked around all these places and I didn't get a sign. I got nothing. And I was standing really feeling hopeless on the side of ruins and at that moment I had this experience again and I knew that then where I was standing must be the place and what I was, where I was standing was right in the middle of the city but it wasn't on the map it wasn't wasn't been designated so this was the beginning of an extremely complicated journey where land had to be changed it had to be We've had, I don't know how many archaeological teams through this space because it's all archaeology. It had to go through Parliament. Uh, it was, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you this in just a few minutes, but I can't, you know, you, you can't imagine if you, the story, if I was going to tell it, would be so unreasonable. But it's just happened to be a series of miracles. and. You know, yes, it was passed through Parliament. Yes, there was a huge competition for it. Yes, um, it is a space. This space turned out to be when it was when it was opened up. You couldn't see it at that time. The space between three cathedrals of different sects, three mosques, one of which hadn't been built yet, so it wasn't even on the map, and one of which, one mosque, had been a crusader church and a turned mosque, then a turned crusader church, then a turned mosque. And right in the very center, again invisible to me, was the shrine to the Virgin Mary, which had been destroyed in the war and had been on that place, in the very center. And the Virgin Mary is as respected by Muslims as by Christians. And this shrine had been a place where uh, Muslims and Christians of all kinds had come to worship. And it's in the very heart, it's very center of the garden. So you can call this magic, you can call this miracles, you can call it, I don't know what you call it, but it certainly was quite beyond me. So that's where, where we are at the moment. Because of the war in 2006, the Israeli invasion in 2006, and the situation, the political situation, the actual building of the garden was stopped um, in its tracks because of this situation. No one could go downtown with big cranes and all the equipment necessary uh, to build the garden. And the army protecting parliament installed itself on part of the garden. Now that we hope will change. We hope that the political situation will ease and that they will um, move off to another place. And then the garden will be on its way. Meanwhile, civil society has begun to embrace um, the garden and has petitioned the government that it be built. So. And what is the, re what is the response of the people of Beirut? I mean, you've well, got the Christians what I'm and the... That Basically, it's invisible to the people of Beirut, but um, there are many people who... Um, there are many people in Beirut who know about it, but the masses probably do not know about it. But this, the fact of 22 NGOs, local NGOs, backing it um, gives, gives great hope. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Alexander. I really Thank appreciate you. your help. Thank you. That's yours? Yes.